Hello, and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast number 2050, 2050, and the topic is nutrition. The title is, Do You Have to Count Calories to Lose Weight? I'm working with a new nutrition client, and in their initial message to me via the website when they signed up for the service, they sent the following. I've tried every diet and have always struggled with strict structure, but I also find that without strict rules, I tend to be too lackadaisical in my choices and decisions. I'll eat bad foods in ways that still fit the diet, even when I know they're not the best choice. I reached out to you because I liked your approach of focusing on one element at a time in respect to calories, then protein, and so on. I feel that if I can understand the why behind the approach, maybe that's what I was missing with the previous diets. I loved it. It was good. We started, uh, well, we sat down, talked, did our our Zoom consultation, and we've uh, started on our way. (laughs) So we were discussing how the first step would be to count and track calories. And in that discussion, the client asked, do you have to count calories to lose weight? And in that discussion, she had mentioned how she had done previous diets that worked, but she didn't have to count calories in those diets. Two things. Number one is they didn't work (laughs) because she's back to being overweight and unhappy with the way she looks. So what she means by they worked was when she was on them, she initially had lost weight, but all that weight came back and she didn't really learn anything from that process. She would just try something. If she followed it, she would lose weight for a while, but for one reason or another, it didn't, it wasn't, she wasn't able to continue to follow it. And then all of a sudden the weight would all come back. So when we think of a diet working, it, in my mind, it only works if the end result is sustained. It doesn't, it, the diet doesn't work if it just drops weight initially and then all the weight comes right back. So that we had to unpack that. Uh, and then we also talked about just that question in general is, do you have to count calories to lose weight? I love that question, and therefore I made today's podcast. <laughs> so the answer is no, you do not have to count calories uh, in order to lose weight. But I do believe it's a pretty damn good idea. <laughs> so I want to cover at first why you don't have to, and then I want to cover my opinion of why it's helpful to do so. Uh, So let's first cover the why you don't have to. All weight loss diets work by creating a caloric deficit. Uh, We've even, I've even made a podcast about uh, why all diets work. (laughs) Um, So there's one podcast, 1,974. It's a nutrition podcast titled, Why Are There So Many Diet Strategies That All Claim to Work? Uh, And then I have another older podcast, 1,712, is a nutrition podcast, Why Even Bad Diets Work. Uh, All diets, if if they're set up relatively decent, and that's most that you're going to see on social media or there's going to be a book about or a program, uh, you know, kind of centered around it, but... What they do is they create a caloric deficit. If you want to learn more details of what I'm about to say, you can listen to that podcast 1974. That would be a good one to get like a good 30, 40 minute in depth detail into uh, why diets work, even if they're crap. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, they don't have to count calories, but they do work temporarily at least because they create a caloric deficit. The deficit is either created by counting calories, or if you don't want to count calories, it's counting points. Still the same kind of a a a symbol, whether it's a number number or a point, uh, is given to a food based on how much energy is in that food. The more energy in the food, the more points it has. The more energy in the food, the more calories it has. Uh, Or the diet will use food choice limitations, such as um, you know low fat, low carb carnivore only, vegan, vegetarian, uh, where there's no animals. Uh, They'll just have some kind of thing where you can eat this, but not that. And by not being able to eat that, (laughs) whatever that is, uh, it reduces your total caloric intake initially because it eliminated a common choice that you would make. And therefore, you're kind of 
dropping that choice and initially people don't replace that choice very well they tend to under replace so therefore they get into an initial deficit and then that is uh, sustained somewhat for some amount of time <laughs> uh, or the diet will use time restrictions think of intermittent fasting you can only eat from you know say 2 p.m to 8 p.m and the rest of the time you can't eat that kind of thing so diets are going to create a caloric basically an energy with any of these methods, uh, essentially what they're doing is they want to reduce the amount of energy you consume. And then compared to the amount of energy you use, and maybe you'll actually pair the diet with a, a method of exercise, which actually increases the energy output, increases the energy you use. Essentially what they're doing is they're creating an energy deficit. You're going to be consuming less energy. You're going to be outputting the same energy or even more and therefore you have an energy deficit if you have an energy deficit your body has to then give up some of its stored energy to fuel that deficit to cover that deficit and therefore you get body fat loss uh, there's an enormous amount to unpack uh, when it comes to whether that is long-term beneficial or not but if we look at the short term you will lose weight if if whatever method you choose point counting, food restrictions, time restrictions. If whatever method you choose is creating an energy deficit, you will lose weight initially. The trouble long term, the reason why things don't work continuously forever, <laughs> is a couple. Number one is our metabolism adjusts. Our body has, uh, it, it, our body allocates energy towards processes every day that are helpful, but they're not necessary for us to live. So as we consume less energy, our body will say, hey, hey, you know, we have less coming in. We have to use more of our reserves. Let's be a little more careful in how we're spending the reserves. So let's reduce our energy allocation to hair, skin, and nails. Let's reduce our energy allocation to random physical jittery and movement. Um, let's tell the, like the brain to tell the body to sit down more often when it can. Uh, it's it just our body adjusts how it spends the energy. This would be the same thing for us. If we're making, you know, whatever we make uh, a month and then it reduces by 20%, you might say, hey, you know, there's a couple expenses I'm making each month that I like them, but they're not necessary, so maybe I'm going to cut that out this month. It's the same process. Our body just, and it, it protects the, the usage of the energy reserve, just as we would protect the usage of our financial reserve, right? So that is one adjustment the body makes, is it reduces its caloric, its energy output. We can, instead of saying calories, I'm saying energy because it's, it helps you get away from the term calories. <laughs> so if, if we spend less energy, we will use less of our reserves and we can be feel safe for longer, which is what we seem to do with finances. The other thing our body does is uh, it starts to eat more within the guidelines. So if at first you say, okay, I'm not going to have any carbs and you eat only fats and proteins. At first, you're probably going to keep the normal portion sizes of fats and proteins that you normally would because that's what you're used to. But then all of a sudden your body registers that there's this enormous energy deficit. And now your portion sizes of fats and proteins start to go up. And that lessens and lessens that deficit until there isn't a deficit at all. Or it's a deficit so marginal that it's not really making great progress. And this would be the same as if we eliminate uh, fats or eliminate um, you know, animal products or uh, non-animal products. <laughs> whatever, the, whatever the food you're eliminating, the food that remains, our portion sizes tend to initially be the same. And then we slowly increase those portion sizes unintentionally uh, or intentionally. <laughs> and all of a sudden that deficit is no longer there. The other thing, and they've done studies to show all these things, all these behavior responses. Another one is we just move less. We have um, like a non, there, there's basically calories associated with our movements per day that are unconscious and they're not exercise. So if you're a jittery person or you don't sit for long and, and you just naturally get up and move and go do the dishes or go do this and you're just kind of like never sitting and that's just your demeanor. You, they will show, studies have shown that some people will start to move less 
when they're in a caloric deficit. But it's not an intentional reduction. It's actually a, a subconscious reduction. Uh, it's just how our body, again, decreases energy expenditure to protect the energy reserve. But they've shown that. So that's, that significant amount of people uh, will reduce their daily movement as a way to reduce that energy deficit. Essentially what happens is the deficit that's initially created becomes less and less and less. And or, since we're not really tracking what we're doing, we're just kind of going by general guidelines, uh, it, it creates this inconsistent deficit. And that leads to inconsistent results, which leads to us giving up on that diet. We try another diet, new set of rules, new set of craziness, and it all ensues again. <laughs> so studies have shown that long term, the long-term reason why most diets fail isn't the inherent way the diet is set up. It's, it's in the fact that we can't be consistent with that method. Some diets are harder to sustain than others. The harder the diet is to sustain, the less likely you are to sustain it. Therefore, the less likely you are to maintain the behaviors that are creating weight loss. So therefore, the less weight loss you keep. <laughs> kind of makes sense. So the correction we're looking for is to find a diet structure that you can be consistent with and a structure that creates a known consistency, a known like variable, like there's, there's components of the diet that we can track and know exactly what we're doing. Meaning we want a diet structure that can be sustained for long term and we want to know definitively how we're sustaining it, meaning we have to know what we're doing. The knowing what we're doing <laughs> addresses behavior changes such as slowly eating more, which lessens the deficit, which lessens progress. If we're tracking specifically what we're eating, we'll know if we're eating more. Slowly moving less. Again, if we track our exercise, if we track our step count, if we track elements that are associated with movement, we would know if we're moving less. We also want to prevent burnout by having over restrictions and just this burden of having to pay attention to every single thing we're doing all the time under these very detailed rules. We also want to be, like, try to work against being frustrated when we don't know how to adjust for unplanned moments in life because they will happen. We want to work against feeling frustrated, frustrated when we can't include social behaviors. If you don't feel like you can go to the movies, you don't feel like you can go out with your friends, you're going to quit that diet because you're more likely to give up a diet than you are to give up social interaction. That is absolutely human nature to have some degree of social interaction. I'm one of the most introverted people on the planet, I think. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy and content to talk to myself all day. <laughs> but it is still nice to have some human interaction. Uh, it is. Uh, but uh, that is something that will slowly break us from a diet is if we feel frustrated by not being able to include social behavior, by not being able to know how to modify when life gets crazy, when we're feeling burned out from the pressure of the diet all the time, all of these elements will add up to us not sustaining the behavior. So do you have to count calories to lose weight? No, you don't. You can use other methods like counting points, food, food choice limitations, time restrictions. You can use other methods and you will have an initial weight loss. The challenge then becomes, can you sustain that behavior long term? For most people, that is the problem, is it, they can't sustain it. For some people, they, they hit this diet structure in man, it just seems to fit them so well. They, they're they good with the food choices. They're good with the structure. Uh, they, 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 it works. It just seems to work. So I have had people tell me that, you know, carnivore diet is the best diet in the world. Everyone should do carnivore diet. I also have people who are vegans and vegetarians who tell me that that's the best diet in the world and everybody should do that. I also have people who follow, you know, keto diets and like they tell me about the mental clarity that they feel and, and how good they feel doing that and then everybody should be doing that. There's so many, I mean, you name a diet and I can tell you somebody that has probably found that diet to be great. But I can also tell you an infinite more somebody's <laughs> 
you probably hated that diet. <laughs> this, the challenge becomes creating a structure that allows for that individual freedom, that individual variance in preference, but still creates a known structure, something that we can modify and adjust to ensure that we're getting progress long term. This is why I do like the idea of counting calories. Not all of my clients count calories, but a significant portion do. I would say probably 80% or more. The ones that don't, it's because of various reasons, but one common one is they just eat the same things all the time. So we created two or three options based on calories, protein, and said, hey, you know, as long as you're eating one of these two or three options, every meal you're fine, and they do that, and they're fine. They literally just eat the same things all the time. It's astounding. <laughs> Perfect. I'm actually one of those people. I am a weirdo like that. I can eat the same meals every single day for a long period of time, months on end, and then maybe I'll make a change to one of the meals because I want to try something different or I want to adjust my calorie intake, and then I'll make a modification. But there's usually only about five or six meals at one time that I'm rotating through, and I'll choose them depending on the time of the day and what I'm going to do that time, that moment of the day, whether I want a bigger meal or a smaller meal. But I really only rotate through five or six meals, and that's it. Uh, so that's one of the ways I do it. And just because it works for me doesn't mean everybody else has to do that, but that is what works for me. And that's why someone such as myself, like I actually still count my calories and protein every day, um, but... I don't use a nutrition tracking app. I actually have a notes feature on my phone. And it, I know, for example, like one of my meals is a yogurt shake. I will uh, take about 10 ounces of juice, whether it's fruit juice, orange juice, whatever. And then I'll put in a cup and a half of fat-free Greek yogurt and one scoop of vanilla protein powder. Shake that all up and drink it. And that's about 500 calories, 65 grams of protein. And that's one of my meals. So if I have that, I already know it's 500 calories, 65 grams of protein. I'm not going to put that in a nutrition app because I don't want to take the time to do that. <laughs> I just know that that's it. So I just write it down in my journal for that day or like my little note feature for that day and say... You know, so far today I've had 500 calories and 65 grams of protein. And then another meal I have is two cans of tuna with a, a pouch of microwavable rice. Uh, that's 800 calories, 70 grams of protein. So I just add those two together. I'm now at 1,300 calories and 135 grams of protein. And that's what I do throughout the day. I just add it up when I eat it. Uh, that works for me. For other people, they want to have variety. They want to have variations. They want to, they, maybe they have a family and they're like, for the love of God, my kids are not going to eat the same thing every night. Totally understand. So we want to use nutrition tracking apps or counting calories as a way to track what we're doing, but it doesn't mean that the way in which I work with clients is you don't have to restrict yourself to specific food choices. So for my cal but for my clients, I don't I don't if they want to be low carb I don't care, that's fine, do that. If you want to be low fat, I don't care, that's fine, do that. If you want to be all animal products, that's fine, do that. If you want to be no animal products, that's fine, do that. <laughs> uh, as long as we're counting calories and protein, I don't. The, the source matters in the sense that we don't want it to come from you know, Oreos and Gatorade all day. <laughs> so we don't want ice cream and pizza all day. The, the source matters, but I don't really care in regards to the, like, the structure in the sense that a huge categorical food, like uh, food categories, have to be completely eliminated or restricted. I have clients that eat probably 70% or more of carbs. I have clients that eat 70% or more of fats. Like it's just, oh, it's just unnecessary. There's so many studies that show that you can lose body fat and control body composition with diets of any fluctuating percentage of fats and carbs. So there's no need to predetermine that. I just let the individual choose that. And then typically, most people are okay with either one. So we say, okay, well, carbs tend to digest faster than fats. So if you're eating a meal during an active time of the day, you would want the energy from that meal to be available. So probably a higher carb percentage in that meal would be better. If you're inactive and you're not really doing anything, well, fats digest slower, so it's a slower release of energy in your bloodstream. Since you have a slower need for energy, 
right now because you're sitting around doing nothing, then we're probably going to focus more on fats. So we'll situationally choose between carbs and fats. Or if somebody wants to predetermine mostly carbs, great. That can work really well for clients who struggle to eat enough. So the carbs will digest quicker. It allows them to get in more meals throughout the day. I also have clients who struggle to eat. They eat too much. So we'll focus more on fats and proteins, and they feel more satiated throughout the day. They don't feel as hungry. They don't need as many meals, and that tends to work better for them. So it's really just the individual choice is what I want to allow. However, we still have to have a known controlled structure, so therefore we're counting calories. That is the best approach in my mind to give known structure so we can predict and create an outcome that we want, but also allows freedom so people can choose foods that fit their preferences. We use nutrition tracking apps in order to just track what we're doing, track our data. One of my favorite things about it is you can also just plug in a common meal and save it as, you know, lunch number one. And then you don't have to plug in all those foods all the time. You can just click lunch number one and it comes up. Um, I don't use the numbers on the tracking apps at all, ever. Uh, I give my clients what calories I want them to follow and protein and timing. Uh, We don't care and we don't even pay attention to carbs and fats unless we're trying to put together a meal specifically for that purpose. But I don't use the the numbers that any app suggests. Uh, In my opinion, they're all trash. (laughs) Um, uh, So uh, what we do is if you want to see a loose process of how it's done, and give you a good ballpark to start with. There's a free document on our website, www.brutalirongym.com. If you go to the website, you can go to Nutrition Education. On that link, you will see the first document is Create Your Own Nutrition Program. You can view it, you can print it. Uh, It has a podcast paired with it, and it'll explain to you how many calories and how much grams of protein you should be uh, aiming for. And then... How do I make adjustments to those uh, over time? And uh, most nutrition tracking apps don't adjust things correctly, and they use singular number points. Like, you have to have 1,676 calories. That's ridiculous. No one's going to get down to a singular calorie every single day. So a lot of people feel like failures if they're slightly under or slightly above. Uh, Even if it was within a normal variance, those apps don't allow you to see what a normal variance is. So uh, I hate most apps. But I do like the effect that they allow you to track your data. (laughs) The other method we use are time blocks. And if you want to learn more about that method, you can check out a podcast... Let me see if I can look it up here. Uh, boo, 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 boo. Time Block Podcast is 1,757. It's a nutrition podcast titled Using Time Blocks for Easier Macronutrient Tracking. If you're trying to find older podcasts and you can't get back that far, you can go to our website, www.brutalarmgym.com. Scroll down to the bottom. Uh, there's a podcast player we have on the homepage, and underneath it are instructions on how to find older podcasts. So you can check out older podcasts. Uh, Our podcast player on our website goes back 300 episodes, so for the next seven episodes, you can actually still go back and check out that podcast 1,757. But Time Blocks is essentially, the short version of it is, uh, most people sleep six to eight hours a day, which means you're awake for 16 to 18 hours a day. If we break that apart into three sections of the day, we would have three sections of around six hours. The first six hours of being awake is the first one-third of your day. The middle six hours of being awake is the middle third of your day. And the final whatever hours of being awake is the final whatever hours, like the final one-third of the day. Uh, So what we do is we aim for a third of our calories and protein in the first third of the day, the first six hours. We then aim for a third of our calories and protein in the middle third of the day, the middle six hours. And then the final one-third of our calories and protein in the final one-third of the day. That allows you to track and your progress and see how you're doing per one to two meals. So every six hours, you're either going to have one or two meals. So you only have to be tracking your data every one or two meals, not per 24 hours. And that reduces the amount of data you have to remember. That reduces the amount of information you have to manage. So it makes it a much easier process. And it's a process you can do mentally. So when my clients travel, when they're out of their normal routines, they'll just read food labels or they'll kind of like enter in their nutrition app real quick what they're having in that meal. 
And they'll say, oh, okay, I know my third values for calories and protein might be 600 calories and 60 grams of protein. I just picked easy numbers. <laughs> so they'll say, okay, this meal is 540 calories and it has 47 grams of protein. I'm pretty close. I'm a smidge under. So I know in the next six hours, if I'm a smidge over, that's okay. And then boom, they're done. They don't have to worry about those six hours anymore. Easy peasy. So you just look up one or two meals at a time, freaking way easier to go. So that this method overall of using calorie counting via nutrition apps, time blocks, and focusing on calories and protein, but allowing freedom of food choice, this method allows for long-term consistency, but it also allows for us to measure what we're doing so we can make adjustments to what we're doing so we can allow for and create long-term progression. We can adjust what we're eating based on what's available. We can adjust when we eat based on our schedule's availability. And we can definitively track what we're doing compared to what we need to do in order to push long-term progress. As you lose weight, you can adjust your behaviors to ensure the continuation of a deficit if a deficit is still needed. So, going back to the original question, do you have to count calories to lose weight? No. But... Is it a method that offers both short-term and long-term benefits? Yes. I've found that it's the best way for people to learn about nutrition and learn how their body uses food. They're learning through this process. And therefore, they can make adjustments in any moments of life for the rest of their life. As compared to people who follow other structures, commonly they don't really know what they're doing or how to adjust anything and they become frustrated and they're always bouncing back and forth between different dietary structures. So hopefully this kind of made the case for counting calories as I do believe that is the best approach to start with. You, you can kind of choose from your own, <laughs> you know, choose on your own based on what I said today. Maybe you have a different experience, but I thought this would be helpful to share that the actual answer is no, you do not, but I do believe it has benefit and there's value to doing so. If you have any questions, if you need anything at all, reach out on our website, www.brutalirongym.com. On the bottom of the homepage is a contact form. You can send me any questions you want, and I will answer you back. I answer everybody within two weeks. If you like the podcast, please share the podcast. The more people we share the podcast with, the more people can be benefited by the podcast. So please share it on social media. That's the best way to reach the most amount of people. Or share it in a conversation. If you're chatting with somebody about health and nutrition or training or whatever, just let them know that the podcast exists. The whole goal is to just spread information that I know 100% works because I've learned it in formal education. I've experienced it myself and with thousands of clients. I taught all this stuff at the university level. I have taught it to well over 3,000 clients in my training history. I'm doing this for 20 years plus. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you need anything, hopefully this, this podcast could be a source of good information for you. Awesome. And then if you like the podcast, please consider donating to support the podcast, which you can do on the website. And if you like the information we share in the podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels. You can find us and follow us on Instagram and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Gym. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.